Um, I'm going to talk a little more broadly about the consequences of the, uh, of the financial, so-called financial crisis. So um, there, there is a, there has been a credit crisis. Every day it's the um, difference between the LIBOR, the London Interbank Offer Rate, which apparently sets credit cards and auto loan rates and commercial um, borrowing and prime business borrowing, uh, the spread between that and the federal funds rate, in normal times it's about uh, 225 basis points, right? But uh, during last week it uh, went up to about 425 basis points. Uh, today it's down to about uh, 200. So people take that as evidence that uh, lending among banks has really declined. Uh, or banks are very cautious about lending to each other. Uh, and if banks are cautious about lending to each other, uh, banks are cautious, allegedly cautious about lending to Main Street or to uh, General Motors and uh, your corner uh, grocery store and restaurants. And uh, that's uh, the so-called uh, credit, credit crunch or credit, credit crisis. So there's some economists that have went and tried to calculate uh, in a very simple way uh, at some investment banks, uh, those that still have jobs at investment banks, said that so GDP will be lower than the credit crunch. This is before the bailout, but I don't know if they really expected the bailout or not, but the tightening of credit would result in US GDP growth lower than 2% than otherwise, over two years. So the next two years, 2009 and 2010, GDP growth would be 2% lower. Uh, so 2% uh, of US GDP is about $280 billion extra loss in GDP due to the financial system. But we're, even without the financial crisis, we would have had a recession, I think, um, anyway, given uh, the fall in housing prices and other things. So that's the consequences. The fiscal costs. The fiscal costs involve <coughs> The 700 billion fiscal cost means, uh, those of you who took my intermediate macro class, is the uh, difference between government revenues and government spending. And in addition to the uh, 700 billion, part of which, or most of which, may be recovered, uh, there may be other costs in potentially in putting money into the banking system and the financial system. So who knows what it is? It could be 500 billion to up to two trillion dollars, and our current net total national debt is about 5.5 trillion. So if you add this, uh, you'll have seven to seven and a half trillion dollars of debt. Uh, what does that mean? Well, U.S. can that's 50 percent of U.S. GDP. Uh, that's not it's not the end of the world, but uh, it means that there'll be less scope for our government spending in other areas, perhaps, and tax increases and higher inflation may be coming down the pipe a few years down the line. Uh, so those fiscal conservatives on the Hill that were against the bailout, part of it was driven by this, that it's just going to increase our government budget debt. Uh, but I think what prevailed was this sense that this credit crunch coming down the pipe is going to uh, damage the economy and better fix that first and then worry about the deficit later. Uh, externally, this increase isn't so big enough that foreigners are going to pull out their uh, stop lending to the U.S. I don't think that's going to be a problem. So the Japanese example, which I've studied a lot, the bailout amount. So Japan had a sort of similar thing that Young described. Uh, and it had a housing bubble and housing prices were 25% of what they were in 1988, and today it's about 30% of what they were in 1980. So they still haven't recovered. The stock market's about a third, even today, of what it was in 1988. So this is a very long-term asset deflation that never came back. But the government spent about 20% of GDP uh, to try to combat the crisis, and uh, it basically bought up these problem loans that were led to housing and raised the capital of the banks. Now, it's not... <laughs> There's a lot of work being done over the last 15 years or so. So this started in, uh, they realized the problem in about 1991 and didn't admit it until about 1998. Uh, and then they put a lot of money in for that, after that. 
but it's not really clear what uh, this uh, crunch, credit crunch, and uh, uh, government bailout, bailout did because there's a lot of work being done on this, and most of the show that, yeah, it helps on certain sectors like small and medium-sized businesses, but in the case of Japan, output was already, permanent output, as you know, in, if you take my class, that's the long-run output of the economy, was already low due to changing demographics and poor productivity growth. The demand for loans was already low, so it's not clear what the credit crunch would have done there. The U.S., um, everyone admits that the Bernanke Paulson team did something right. So it's, they recognized the problem. It came out about a year ago, the subprime problem, although the financial authorities knew about potential problems arising from fa fa uh, falling housing prices in about, 19, in, in about 2006, so two years ago. But the U.S. really recognized the problem quickly in, in one year whereas in other countries, like Japan, it took seven years, and the bailout was very quick, it was immediate. Uh, immediately money was put in. So, um, so I think that was, that was good. But I think with the problem so far, the response was, uh, there really isn't a consistent set of rules to deal with the crisis. So it's been, it's been so haphazard. You save, uh, you let Lehman Brothers go, but you save AIG, and then you have this bailout plan. So you don't really know if the government's willing to save all banks, large banks, investment banks, assets of hedge funds. And I think we still don't know uh, what the government response is. And that creates, that I think was, introduced a lot of uncertainty in the system and a lot of fear in lending among financial institutions to another because they didn't know which financial institutions were safe and which were not. And not only that, they didn't know what the balance sheets were in each financial institution. So, uh, so, that's, so we, we really need a consistent set of rules and for the U.S. government to follow the rules. So Michael touched on this, and, and I tend to think um, moral hazard is, a, is as serious a problem as Michael. Michael started it off by saying, hey, Wall Street's not to blame, but toward the end, he was really railing against Wall Street. So I think, I think he and I are on the same page on this, that... Uh, um, of course, we should not bail out all finance institutions, uh, including regional banks, hedge funds, and insurance companies, because what that means is that the upside risk, they get the upside risk, but the downside risks are socialized, right? So a common thing with, I don't know, this, this sort of more lefty-oriented analyst would say, capitalism is a privatization of gains and a socialization of losses, right, of the too big to, too big to fail banks. <laughs> And it's, it's not untrue. I mean, I was, I was working at the Fed and Federal Reserve Bank in New York in 2006 and 2007, and I talked a lot with uh, hedge fund people and investment bankers, and their view was, well, if they um, issue asset-backed securities against real estate or, or land or housing and write derivative contracts or credit default uh, um, contracts against these, they're going to be bailed out because Congress and the U.S. government's uh, going to look after Main Street and look after the poor homeowner. So we're, gonna, we're covered on the down end so we can go crazy and try to gamble on this. And this has been, it's been, uh, they didn't say this directly as I did, but it's, it's something that was commonly known among uh, the smart money people on Wall Street. And right now who are complaining, people on Wall Street are complaining, so-called dumb money people who lost a lot of money, but on the other hand, there's a Paulson who works for a um, hedge fund, and he made $3.5 billion last year uh, shorting against asset-backed securities that they would fall. So he made money on betting that these securities would fall. So essentially, there's a, there's a game going on in Wall Street that was based on uh, the exchange of these assets. So we do need to worry about that in the future. Um, so now, because of the consolidation of the U.S. banking system, almost all banks are now too big to fail, including new commercial banks, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. So, you know, we, we really, as, as Michael said, we do need to worry about regulation of these, uh, of these institutions uh, so that this will not happen again. So, anyway, after a couple of years, U.S. growth should return to an average of uh, 2 to 2.5% 2 per year because of the fundamental solid labor force growth, productivity growth, 
Uh, and Japan has more structural problems that it can't grow above 1.5 percent. As the investment banks become commercial banks, the loosely regulated hedge funds and private equity firms uh, will take the place of the investment banks as major risk takers. But are you going to rate? They're presently unregulated. Are they going to be regulated? Do they ever be held up? These financial structure issues are going to be kind of the major challenge, I think, for the for the next administration, and uh, uh, we really should not be uh, delayed.